where I was able to fi finalize the book. Um, I want to especially thank all the staff um, who worked hard to make this event possible, and the history department, um, the Center for European Studies, and the Smathers Library for their generous support. The publication of colonial fantasies in period reality is a major personal accomplishment, one that with a full-time job in administration, I never thought I could achieve. Of course, there are many people who helped me in the process, and I don't have the time here to thank um, them properly. However, I do not want to miss the opportunity of speaking today without uh, thanking or mentioning three groups who were incredibly helpful. First, I was fortunate enough to work with directors and colleagues who were deeply committed to my professional develop, development and who created intellectual spaces that further my scholarship. That really made a difference when working on this book and financing the last stretch of the research. My advisors, two of whom are in this room, Jeff and Nancy Hunt, um, welcomed the idea of this project since the very start. I am immensely grateful to them, not only for providing me with the theoretical and methodological tools to carry out the project, but also for encouraging me and supporting my out-of-the-box ideas while pulling me back when I was um, too far away from the box. <laughs> um, last but not least, I want to thank my former and current students in Michigan, Puerto Rico, Ecuador, and Florida for all they have taught me throughout the years. Thank you, Lisa Krause and Nana Rodel. <laughs> the students are the real reason that um, I, uh, the, the real reason that I give my 100% and plus to administration. So I'm going to give you a description of the project. Um, so Colonial Fantasies in Pure Realities is a fairly ambitious project that follows Polish and German colonial endeavors in three contexts. The eastern borderlands of the German Empire, the German colonies in Africa, and Polish colonies in southern Brazil, mainly in the state of Paraná. I spent almost two years doing research in several archives in Germany and Poland, supplemented by one research visit to the Polish Library in Paris and two research visits to Brazil. My analytical framework led me to work with primary sources in Polish, German, and Portuguese in my attempt to understand Polish-German relations in the 19th and early 20th century from a global, transnational, and transregional perspective. For those of you not familiar with Polish history, this is the time, or, or the book um, studies the time, um, when Poland did not exist as a nation state, but was partitioned among the German, Russian, and Austro-Hungarian empires. A series of anti-Polish measures that limited Polish language and culture in the different partitions, along with political and economic transformations adopted at the time, pushed many Poles, particular, particularly peasants and dissidents, to migrate and form colonial enclaves, um, mainly to the Americas. Today, the largest Polish diaspora are located in um, the Midwest of the US and in Southern Brazil. Centering my work in the Eastern borderlands gave me the opportunity to show how connected the Polish question was to processes of modernization, definition of Germanness, and colonial that dynamics that transcended imperial divides. In the book, I propose a post-colonial reading of the Eastern borderland and of Polish and German cultural relations um, that helped me put race at the forefront of the analysis. Through the study of medical records, public health debates, and the mobility of diseases and peoples through the borderlands, I study how Poles were viewed as colonized others in the German Empire. I also study how invested Polish nationalists were in colonial projects, showing how prevalent 
and pervasive colonialism was as a system of power in the 19th century, and how colonial discourse and relations reverberated back to Europe. Contrary to early approaches of the Polish partitions and the study of Poles within the German Empire, I wanted to recast the um, dynamism, dynamism of the borderlands and enrich historians' analysis that mainly saw the region through the lens of ethnicity and cultural, cultural ethnic battles among Germans, Poles, and Jews in the region. The transnational perspective and the study of medicine helped me place the attention on networks, racial discourses, and the colonization plans that aim to engineer populations through migration. Studying the works of Polish physicians allow me to incorporate their views into general debates about the management of diseases, scientific racism, and civilizing projects that are seldom studied in the history of the scientific achievements that Germans accomplished in the 19th century. This is the century of Robert Koch and other famous German physicians that were not only highly important for the German Empire, but also other empire um, um, moreover, studying medicine and the professionalization of um, medicine in the 19th century helped me to highlight how medicine and scientific knowledge were um, implicated in imperial and national projects and how physicians and scientists responded to imperial and national interest. One of the main contributions that colonial fantasies in pure realities makes to the scholarship, in my view, is um, in the realm of overseas colonies. Uncovering how Poles were implicated in colonial projects helped us understand not only the interest that Poles had um, in, in much uh, later on in the interwar period once they obtained independence, but also how colonial dynamics um, were at the center of subject formation in, in Central Europe. So in the 19th century, um, the fact that you had or not had or weren't able to have um, uh, matter a lot um, about um, on how you saw yourself and it being included in, in, in this what people call what, what is to be European. And you know, polls on the German partitions were very traumatized that they were not quite Europeans, so they use this colonial realms to to assert their um, belonging to 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 the um, to, to the European identity. So, writing about Polish colonial fantasies and colonial works in Africa and Brazil allows for comparative projects with other European groups who participated in the process of colonialism from a marginalized standpoint within empire. So looking at empires from that perspective allows us to question categories neatly attributed to colonizers and colonized and help us to complicate these categories in a colonial context and in colonial studies. And what I mean by um, other European groups from a, a marginalized standpoint, I'm mainly thinking of other um, European um, groups like the Irish, Scott and um, others who were not um, who were st struggling with um, um, not not being um, um, fully recognized as part of the empires they were uh, they belong. But then when they went to colony, they were highly invested in these colonial projects. So so studying Polish. Um, German relations from that perspective opens up comparative analysis with studying, you know, the Irish, the British Empire, and, and others, and also um, the perspective of medicine and and, and especially um, this racialization of um, scientific discourse. Um, I once heard that it's also useful to study um, Japanese and Korean relations. <laughs> so it's interesting that whenever I'm presenting my work, there are always all these comparisons that, um, you know, that make me think that this, these problems are um, um, very um, common during the 19th and early 20th century. 
So uh, I see my study as a step forward in this direction, and I hope that the framework is taken by many others to enrich, in, enrich the landscape of postcolonial studies in Eastern Europe, Latin America, and Africa. Muchas gracias. Thank you. which was done after she finished her dissertation on Central Europe uh, and Polish immigration. Um, and before I talk about what I learned from reading this book, and specifically about how this book contributes to Brazilian history, because that's why I was invited, um, I want to underscore how appropriate it is that the author has created a career in area studies and is now associate director at one of the most distinguished Latin American studies centers in the country. Because her research required not only phenomenal language skills in three languages that do not include either her first or second language, <laughs> and uh, not only that, but also uh, equally important, the success of this project really required a sensibility to a transnational perspective that's built on deep contextual understanding of specific areas, and in her case, several specific areas. Um, but this is, of course, the main goal of area studies, and which Lenny very much understands. So Lenny gained that contextual understanding through two years of field work in Europe, and then after completing her dissertation while working full time in a very high pressure situation, she was amazingly uh, able to also intensively study Brazilian history, teach on Brazilian history and, and European immigration to Brazil, and then punctuate that work with several short research stints to Brazil. Um, and the last chapter of the book is the result of work over, um, over a couple of years. So the book overall, uh, I highly recommend it if you haven't read it. Um, it offers a sophisticated analysis of political and scientific discourses on race and empire as they manifest across very different 19th century sites. And this sounds like a familiar topic, race and empire. Um, so it was especially surprising to see so many new revelations about how the meaning of European nationalism and the scramble for empire in the 19th century, how these meanings shift when viewed from a Polish perspective. And it was clear throughout the book that colonialism was a crucial element in the construction of European national ethnicities. And over the first couple of chapters, colonial fantasy shows that the Prussian Empire's quest to Germanize the Polish region is a prime example of this. Astonishingly, at least it was really astonishing to me, after the defeat of the 1863 January uprising, which dashed Polish hopes of reviving an imagined ethno-state in Central Europe, Polish intellectuals fantasized that they could do so. They could establish this Polish ethno-state through settler colonialism. And this is the backdrop to the final chapter of the book, which is an incredibly original and rich analysis of how disparate global historical processes intersect in Paraná, in the south of Brazil. Um, beginning in 1871, when 32 Polish families decided to join an agricultural colony there. And over the next 50 years, nearly 100,000 more Poles followed their path in a phenomenon that many elite Poles fearfully dubbed the Brazilian fever. And as a historian of Brazil, um, I thought I knew this story already. Um, and of course, I knew that many Poles, alongside Germans and other Eastern Europeans, immigrated to Brazil, and they went to the south. Um, probably the most visible Polish immigrants were those who uh, settled in cities, such as Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, as was the case for many Polish Jews who went to Brazil. Um, large numbers of Jewish men uh, went into um, various working class professions, but particularly they worked as itinerant peddlers 
while a small but very visible number of Jewish women went into prostitution. And in fact, the feminine form of the word for Polish in Brazil, Polaka, is referred at the time to poor white Jewish prostitutes. Um, higher end prostitutes were known as, generally known as uh, French, Francesas. And some of these women were lured through criminal trafficking networks, um, what European reformers would sensationalistically call the white slave trade. And Jeffrey Nadell, who's here, um, wrote a marvelous book uh, about what's known at the time as the Tropical Belle Epoque in Rio de Janeiro. Um, and he analyzes the elevated status of these European Francesas as representative of the ways that Brazil's elite constructed its identity as white and European through ostentatious consumption. Um, and many Brazilians viewed European pro prostitutes as, and courtesans as elements that would civilize Brazil's crude patriarchs when they visited the cities like Rio or Sao Paulo. But the government's, that's not what Lenny's writing about. <laughs> <laughs> the government's main plan for civilizing and Europeanizing their nation in the 19th century, um, the nation that was a mostly or overwhelmingly rural, didn't involve urban prostitutes or peddlers, and instead the plan was to modernize by replacing nomadic indigenous groups and enslaved rural laborers and their descendants with free white immigrants who would also colonize the hinterlands. So there was a law, a liberal land law of 1850, which privatized and required um, uh, title to all land holding, and this led to the dispossession of Brazilian subsistence squatters in many regions and made it really difficult for formerly enslaved laborers or new immigrants to stake out an independent homestead. So many of the formerly enslaved continued working for old masters, for their former masters, often under coercive conditions. Many fled to cities where racist employment practices made it impossible for them to compete with the European immigrants, many of whom were also moving to the cities. But the situation for the Polish immigrants that Lenny studies in the south of Brazil was quite different. So the land law created mechanisms by which private agents could create these colonies and invite people um, to come to them. And Various government entities offered incentives to lure these immigrants, such as free land and tools and subsidies where they, while they resettled their families. And these colonies that came to Brazil, largely in, in the South, these were largely German, Polish, and Ukrainian, have been the topic of various studies in southern Brazil um, within Brazilian historiography more generally. And some of these studies have looked at Brazilian and European sources. Um, many more local studies document, document folkloric elements and aspects of the Europeans' experiences in Brazil. But this book, um, Lenny's book, is original in its contextualization of the Polish colonies within the history of European empires and the scramble for colonies in Africa and Asia, and in its thorough integration of transnational perspectives. I really haven't read anything like it. Um, I, I actually have read something like it. It was a dissertation, really recent dissertation, by someone named um, Andre Decro, which you should look at, about um, Japanese immigration in Sao Paulo, which uses Japanese, which does what you do, using the two sources and really taking a transnational look and thinking about this immigration within the larger context of Japanese imperial thinking and racial thinking. Um, but anyway, despite, back to Lenny's book, despite fears that their homeland was being vacated by Poles, many Polish intellectuals and nationalists came to agree that establishing colonies in Brazil was a necessary means of cultural survival in the face of partition and Germanization. And other places were also considered, but rejected. So although Polish, and so this is really amazing, another chapter of the book talks about Polish explorers who had their sights on colonizing Africa. But there, there was much too much competition from other European powers. So the Polish scientists found themselves um, in, uh, working as adjuncts to the German imperial project that they increasingly condemned. Um, colonization of the United States was uh, also ruled out because Poles were considered inferior there and they were unable to form ethnic enclaves. So in Brazil, prior to the creation of the Polish colonies in Paraná, 
Poles had migrated to German colonies that were established earlier, but tensions between the two groups, between Germans and Poles, followed them to their new home. And moreover, both the German state and Polish journalists decried abuses of their country folk in Brazil, where some groups had fallen victim to criminal or unscrupulous agents, and they were subjected to coercive labor situations. So, and the accounts of the abuse that Lenny describes in the book strike me as racialized and sensationalized in ways that are really similar to the publicity surrounding the white slave trade. So then, as now, human trafficking included sexual and other forms of exploitation, while the attempts to control it were inflected with very unhelpful gender and racial prejudices and stereotypes. And this comes through really clearly in her discussion about these um, fears of what could happen to these vulnerable populations. But in any case, these negative impressions and accounts of human trafficking were reversed by the experiments in the south of Brazil, and specifically in Paraná, um, where regional governors competed to attract immigrant uh, farmers and their families who would supply the cities and then also keep the indigenous groups far away. Um, the Brazilian government welcomed these white Catholics, and it didn't attempt to change their customs or suppress their language. Um, actually, that would happen, but not until the 1930s. And so these immigrants also received support from a host of institutions back in the Polish region. So there were many institutions in Austria and Poland that sought to ensure that Polish immigrants would remain loyal and committed to their mission to reproduce the Polish ethno-nation. And immigration societies sent teachers, priests, and intellectual leaders who could guide the colonist intellectual and cultural development in Brazil. And several Polish scientific expeditions um, sent to visit their country folk in Brazil at the turn of the century confirmed that these families were flourishing there. And remarkably, they affirmed that the colonial physical environment was much better, much healthier than Europe. And this was during a period when Brazil as a whole struggled to dispel its reputation as a breeding ground for moral and physical contagion. So this was really good news for Brazil. Um, it turns out that offering a group of intact peasant families favorable economic conditions, a tight-knit community, social service amenities, medical services, and superior social status, and I think the latter is especially important. All of this was a formula for success. In, in one of the chapter's most interesting passages, Lenny contrasts the way Polish and Brazilian nationalists explain um, and claim victory in describing the triumph of this southern colonial experiment in the 1920s. So the Polish observers included some scientists who were traveling around Latin America um, and visit their countrymen in Brazil. And they talk about how the colonists man managed to thrive amid a hopelessly inferior race and culture because they guarded their distance. They remained segregated. Um, they maintained their Polish culture and their habits of order, industriousness, and morality. And ironically, um, Polish elites in the 1920s used the same kind of comparisons that apologists for Germanization of ethnic Poles had used in the German Eastern borderlands against <laughs> Polish. Um, and then by retaining these superior traits, according to these Polish observers, by resisting contamination by their inferior Brazilian neighbors, they took their place at the top of the social hierarchy in this farming community, <laughs> while serving as a positive model for the Brazilians, some of whom even learned Polish. So these travelers and scientists never mentioned that black, indigenous, and mixed race Brazilians, who came to be known during this period as nationals, national workers, in contrast to the Europeans, they were never offered the land, infrastructure, and government subsidies that were reserved for the immigrants. And of course, they didn't mention the psychological and physical toll that racism takes on its victims. So in contrast, so that was the Polish view of this success. So in contrast, in the 1920s, Lenny also talks about some of the Brazilian views of why these colonies were successful. Um, Brazilian nationalists lauded the Poles for thoroughly assimilating into local society, explaining their success as the re result of mixing with and learning from the locals. So they behaved like true Brazilian gauchos. Gauchos are like the southern cowboys in Brazil. Um, they produced an improved national race through miscegenation. 
So these two analyses really beautifully illustrate the contrasting meaning and goals of colonization from the perspective of European and Brazilian nationalism and their corresponding racial fantasies. So by the 1930s, it was clear that the Polish colonial fantasy was dissolving, just as a new ideology of Brazilian national identity rested on supposedly harmonious cultural and racial mixture. The state mandated assimilation at that time in the 1930s, now the language was suppressed. Um, they prohibited education in Polish or German, while demanding that employers favored national workers. And moreover, the colonists themselves contributed to the demise of the Polish colonial fantasy, as most of them had apparently not envisioned their lives in Brazil as dedicated to the, uh, the reproduction of the Polish nation. In fact, their political proclivities and their economic strategies <coughs> adhered to their local interests. So for example, although they established Polish newspapers and cultural organizations, they also joined a regional rebellion, um, and they often supported political candidates from neighboring German settlements. So up to the present, descendants of Polish immigrants, which um, are an estimated 1.5 to 2 million in Brazil, they preserve the folkloric aspects of their Polishness. So you can go to these towns in the south of Brazil and you can see Polish festivities and Easter eggs and things like that. Um, but apparently few have been inclined to establish really tight political or economic ties over the 20th century to their struggling homeland. Instead, they have enjoyed their elevated social status in a nation where racial democracy remains a powerful myth. And this myth has experienced a resurgence in recent years when Brazil has joined Poland, among other nations, in its sharp turn to the ultra-right. Um, and I'll stop there, but I have some questions for Lenny about what that means in terms of Polish identification with uh, events in Europe um, and with its homeland over the 20th century and more recently. So thank you, um, and thank you again to Lenny for writing this wonderful book and for inviting me to talk about it. Real pleasure. Uh, I first met Lenny uh, in September 2000, uh, well, at the dawn of what rapidly proved uh, a dangerous new century. <laughs> in the History Department of Michigan, we have a required introductory uh, course for all incoming graduate students, History 615, which brings all the new students together, irrespective of field, um, for a common encounter with current approaches to the discipline. Uh, it provides an opportunity for whole cohort building, along with a sense of what it's like these days to be joining the profession and discipline of history. The character of the class shifts over the years depending on who happens to be teaching it. It rotates through the faculty, uh, pairing a couple of people each year from different fields. Deals with theories and methods, something old, something new, uh, a broad guide to historiography, so far as possible, globally and comparatively understood. So in fall 2000, uh, Gina Moran Sanchez, Gina's sitting in the front there, Gina Moran Sanchez and myself, a US historian and a Europeanist, taught History 615. Uh, we titled the early sessions, uh, Historiographical Trends and Dilemmas, Foucault for Historians, Gendering the Master Narrative, Ways of Remembering and Forgetting, uh, you sort of get the picture. A bit later, we came to race, imperialism, and the colonial moment, and we eventually ended with the personal is historical. Um, among our 18 or so students that year were these three theory heads from Puerto Rico, from the University of Puerto Rico, <laughs> who sat in a row on our right, at the head of the table, <laughs> Uh, looking very stern and uh, very self-possessed. They were each impressively well-versed in the current debates inspired by feminism, critical race theory, and the various posts, especially post-structuralism and post-colonialism. And at a certain point in each seminar, let's say it was around the 37-minute mark, <laughs> they invariably called us to post-colonial account. 
And when preparing the class, we worried it. We wondered a bit, actually, about the incoming students' receptiveness to theory, but clearly we needn't have worried. <laughs> Lenny did her term paper, not on Germany or Poland, uh, but on Caribbean discourses of masculinity. And as the final reading that we'd chosen um, for the class was a 1995 Stuart Hall piece on negotiating Caribbean identities, I think we may have passed Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> So in these brief remarks, I want both to celebrate the interest and importance of this book, while reflecting a little on the distinguishing Leniness of its production and uh, character. And I'll start by uh, saying something about the surrounding historiographical context that inspired and made possible the projects such as this, because I don't think it was thinkable until a certain point in, uh, in um, our, life, our lives as historians. And then I'll pick out um, a few particular features of, of a book. Now, I've already gestured toward uh, one huge part of that enabling context in the consequences of what came to be known as the cultural turn in history, the cultural turn in history, particularly in relation to subaltern studies and uh, post-colonial theory along with the subsequent challenges of learning to think, write, and teach in global and transnational directions. Those consequences were felt not just in the broadening of history's methods and subject matters and the associated pedagogies in the more strictly academic disciplinary sense, they also involved two impulses that were part of the far larger upheaval across the humanities and social sciences during the later 1980s and 1990s, which Lenny describes very eloquently in her preface. The first impulse was the pursuit and valuing of diversity, along with the attendant democratizing of knowledge, which helped produce a very different ecology of research and debate than historians had commonly presumed before. But then second, history's conversation became quite radically opened up towards other disciplinary fields of knowledge, not just in the social sciences, especially sociology, where the main excitement could be found during the earlier social history wave of the 1960s and 1970s, but now to literary studies, anthropology, psychoanalysis, and what came to be known as cultural studies. This new kind of interdisciplinarity involves what Lenny calls, quote, the creation of new epistemologies across disciplinary boundaries. Very nice phrase. The creation of new epistemologies across disciplinary boundaries. Indeed, uh, Lenny was a participant in several cohorts of graduate students at the turn of the century who were able to reap the best benefits of all of that ferment because the old battles of the culture wars were now dying down, and the new was finally having the chance to be born. Adapting Gramsci as you may recognize. And in fact, Lenny was a key instigator in bringing, in bringing uh, together a bunch of those fall 2016-615ers together, bringing them together for a wonderful conference that met first in Puerto Rico in 2007 and then in Michigan to follow up in 2008 on the topic of thinking through the cultural turn. The generation reflects, colon, writing histories in an interdisciplinary and transnational age. And as those cohorts publish their books uh, and enter the maturity of their mid-careers, there's much to be said about that distinctive generational presence and that period at the turn of the century through the early 2000s. Now, another major context for Lenny's work was the remarkable growth of interest in the late 90s and early 2000s in empire. For a while, empire was everywhere. I don't think it's gone away exactly, but for a while, empire was unmissable in uh, historical discussion, whether in national historiographies or as a latent master category of general comparative analysis for the later 19th and 20th centuries, 
further confirmed, of course, by all of the concurrent noise and commotion of globalization talk. The nation state was suddenly passe. Imperial rule was the normative for how state territorial sovereignties were actually organized in the 19th century. National states were imposters, achieving only brief and misleading ascendancy between 1918, 19, and the 1960s in Europe. The apogee was probably Jane Burbank and Fred Cooper's Empires in World History that came out in 2011, where empire acquired superordinate transhistorical importance for state formation in world history overall, against which other territorial polities, like the nation state, were only transitory and insignificant. And in the German field, the high tide ran from the pioneering edited volume on the imperialist imagination, published in 1998, through uh, Mark Mazower's Hitler's Empire 10 years later, um, and uh, to uh, perhaps to a volume edited by Bradley Naranj and me in 2013 called German Colonialism in a Global Age. Advocacy of transnational approaches was eloquently staged by many of the people involved in those volumes and discussions. Andrew Zimmerman's Alabama in Africa, Sebastian Conrad's Globalization of the Nation are the emblematic works, I think. Interest in empire and colonialism, <coughs> global perspectives, and transnational analytics resonated patently with one another. And George Steinmetz's remarkable volume, Sociology and Empire, The Imperial Entanglements of a Discipline, supplies a fascinating intellectual history for this game-changing process. George was also on Lenny's committee. So that's the context, I think. On the one hand, you know, the cultural turn and interdisciplinarity and the new opportunities and the possibilities that that opened up precisely for creative projects like this one. And then secondly, this new interest, this, this uh, broadening interest in empire in the ways that I've just been describing. Now, one vital aspect of this boom in empire has been to bring German-Polish relations, that is, German relations with Polish-speaking populations and historically Polish territories, freshly inside a complex but singular conceptual framework of colonialism. Because Polish, German Polish relations weren't considered <coughs> under that rubric of colonialism until relatively recently. And Lenin's is one of the pioneering attempts properly to, to establish that ground. Now, first, uh, you know, a singular common, uh, con a singular conceptual framework of colonialism first under Prussian annexation during the 18th and 19th centuries, and then during Germany's imperialist drive to the East during the two world wars. But scholars like Jürgen Zimmerer in his studies of colonial genocide, Wendy Lauer in Nazi empire building and the Holocaust in Ukraine, were also showing the fruitfulness of thinking overseas colonialism and landward expansionism in the East together. In incredibly revealing ways, historians began exploring the always complicated back and forth between the metropole and varying colonial arenas, including the transference of types of knowledge, idioms of thought, direct and vicarious experiences, spectacular events like the genocide in Southwest Africa, um, arresting and seductive images compelling arguments about economics, prosperity, and survival, um, a visual repertoire of fantasy and desire, manifold types of everyday consumption, and all the relevant registers of governmentality. And in tracking the convoluted, fantasy-ridden, and frequently unexpected journeying of her Polish and German colonizing subjects across such a wide diversity of non-European settings, all across Africa to Brazil, Lenny captures beautifully these far more complex and graduated manifestations of colonialism. And I want to spin this out a bit, a bit further. Informed by the recent historiography of the Nazis' racial state, 
including not least the pioneering studies of the occupation of Poland after 1939 and the character of the intended imperial new order for the occupied Soviet Union, much extraordinarily fruitful work has now been emerging on the complicated equivalences between overseas or saltwater colonialism before 1914 and Germany's landward expansionism to the east. Some of the most innovative scholarship tracks the genealogies of the Nazis' imperialist designs back into the imperial period before 1914. So that analyses of the racial state have profoundly reshaped our grasp of the relationship between race, science, public health, eugenics, social engineering, and the larger complex of modernizing reform in that earlier era too. Similarly, the most recent debates over Nazi modernity have enormous and unsettling implications for how we approach questions of planning, technology, population, and national efficiency in the period before 1914, not just in Germany, but also elsewhere. In other words, German historians now see the congruences and complicated reciprocities between German experiences of the eastern borderlands inhabited by Poles and the more recent collisions between Germans and Africans on the colonial frontier overseas, where German nationalist conceptions of the eastern frontier grew from deeply embedded antagonisms going back over several centuries, of course, the dynamics of colonialism in Africa involve far more novel encounters with foreignness and exoticism, and so a great deal is promised by bringing these two distinct histories into dialogue. And the possibilities of such a comparison become all the more pregnant given the dramatic loss to Germany of both types of territory in the wake of 1918. Recent historiography of race shows just how intimately these two theaters of the nationalist imagination have become linked discursively together, and this new scholarship further broadens the context in which Lenin's work can be placed. Now, if Lenin's work helps illuminate the long arc of Germany's fixation on the East, and helps further clarify the, con the continuity con conundrum in German history, I mean, where did the Nazis come from? And she also deepens our knowledge of the Polish side of the equation, too. As she says, the greater willingness to read Germany's Polish histories as a specifically colonialist project invariably leaves Polish perceptions and practices out. So not the least of her book's pioneering accomplishments is to put the Poles brilliantly back in whether as the subjects of an alien system of rule inside the lands of the German partition, as the ready practitioners in a socio-medical regime of public hygiene, sanitary regulation, and spatial governmentality, as the vicarious participants in a colonial imaginary, not exactly of their own making, and as the traveler, observers, and scientific expeditioners into colonized African worlds as the advocates of Polish migration to Brazilian Latin America. What Lenny does especially well is to show how the impetus of German colonizing interventions between the 1840s and 1880s worked insidiously with the grain of Polish aspirations for knowledge, professional advancement, and social betterment to shape a commonly inhabited colonial imaginary, whether from the challenges of managing and defeating cholera and typhus, or from the fantasies of discovering and mastering exotically other non-European worlds. It's this dialectic that comes through most strikingly from the book overall. On the one hand, then he shows how the medicalized discourse of social containment and regulative governmentality, quote, contributed to the construction of the eastern borderlands as a colonial space that begged for German sanitary intervention, unquote, in ways that echoed earlier ethnographic discourses 
um, that underlined uncivilized and unhealthy Polish practices, not a quote. But at the same time, Poles developed their own colonial fantasies that positioned them vis-a-vis -vis colonial subjects in overseas colonies, mirroring German radical nationalists in Prussian Poland, the colonial context became a crucial realm for Poles and the Polish nationalist movement. The colonies came to represent the place where Poles could overcome their subaltern condition and show other European powers their skills in communist activities. That's not a quote. Now, this is incredibly insightful and original. This is really, really insightful and original. Actually, it's dynamite. By examining the dynamically structured relations between nationalist Germans and Prussian Poles as they were made and remade in the period between the 1840s and the 1920s, we gain fascinating access to political imaginations on either side. In so doing, we challenge, quote, the neat dichotomies scholars have used in the past to approach European and colonial societies. The in-betweenness of Prussian Poles, being part of Germany but not quite, puts into evidence the tensions underpinning scientific discourses, national agendas, and imperial projects in the 19th century. Moreover, approaching the eastern borderlands as a civilizing frontier has opened the door for comparative analysis, analyses within and beyond the realm of the German empire. That's a big block quote from the book. Then he seeks to, quote, move the analysis of Polish and German subjectivities past the colonizer-colonized divide by bringing attention to the pervasiveness of colonial discourse and racial thinking and their political effectiveness, unquote. So it's this in-betweenness, it's this in-betweenness in the end that Slaney's most powerful contribution she argues compellingly against understanding colonialism too narrowly around the power exercised by the colonizing perpetrator over the predicament of the colonized victim or subordinate. Thus, 19th century colonialism not only involved the establishment of the rule of colonial difference, she argues, but also concerned itself with assimilation discriminatory knowledge, colonial ambivalence, and in-betweenness. Now this very particular German-Polish case, whose post-1840s history cycled from oppressively distributed in-betweenness through radicalized Germanization to horrendously brutalized genocidal violence, forces us to pay attention to complexity, to overlapping and competing discourses and the profound impact that colonialism had on the daily lives, political plights, and racial attitudes of men and women throughout the German Empire and the adjacent Polish territories. That's another quotation and book. And so finally, I simply want to celebrate uh, this remarkable book, which not only sheds such fascinating light on German-Polish relations, but also tracks uh, Polish history into such unexpected places, beautifully complicates our understanding of colonialism and its effects, and opens such brilliant opportunities for comparison. And there's been an enormous amount of cheerleading for the importance of doing transnational history in recent years. Uh, but although many have talked the talk, it's only a few that have actually walked the <laughs> <laughs> so. so, thank you so much both for your comments. I'm very moved. I don't know how to, <laughs> to um, respond to that. Um, and I'm very happy that you mentioned the 615 cohort because it was really uh, a moment um, in, in my, my 
graduate studies that mark me and, and you know, um, this, um, my, my best friends, Juan Hernandez and Marie Cruz, the three of us were accepted um, with full um, support to the University of Michigan. And the three went from Puerto Rico to Michigan, and we were like a family. But the, the thing is that, that I want to mention is that by training at the University of Puerto Rico, at this moment that Jeff is describing as the, you know, the, the we, we used to call Puerto Rico the post-colonial, the, the post, um, post-modern turn, Michigan cultural turn. Like, it was very fundamental to us because um, there was a, a division, a, two camps in, in the history department. You were either uh, the old school or you were a postmodern, and we were more <laughs> the postmodern side. So going to, moving to, to, Mich to Michigan and being exposed to the wonderful work of social historians and cultural historians really enrich our understanding of the world. And it's not a coincidence that I am interested in the topics that I address in the book because those are issues that were um, that are highly timely in Puerto Rico. They were timely then when I was forming my my, my studies, but also they're timely uh, now. The question of um, colonialism, when they're not supposed to be an official colony, <laughs> and um, in Puerto Rico, uh, my major was in European. Uh, history, but the fact that you take European courses with Puerto Rican scholars and, and, and the lack of resources forces you to, re to really make comparisons to Latin America and the Caribbean. So I was always happy to bring the Caribbean history anywhere I could. And I think I do it in my book from... <laughs> um, this theoretical framework. And it's also not a coincidence that I'm interested in polls because at the time that I'm studying them, they were second class Prussian citizens. They were like fighting for the civil rights to be recognized, their, their culture. And so those, those were, of course, topics that we <laughs> deal with in Puerto Rico. So when I was doing archival research, and I show up at Polish archives, more in Polish archives than in German archives, um, I was welcomed by Poles. Um, I was so exoticized. I was like the person who didn't fit in. <laughs> and like, if people expect that you you know, study the history that at least uh, if you're coming from not if you're coming from Latin America, African, or other like non um, European or U.S. Um, um, uh, country, then they expect you to, to study. If I come from Puerto Rico, they expect you to study Puerto Rican study uh, history. So I always. Um, um, try to fight that, and when I entered the history program, I was like, I'm not following the Latin American track, I'm following European history, because I, I can have a space in European history. And, and, and when I went to the archives, I, I often was um, um, questioned, like, um, like, are you Polish? And then they would like, see me again, and say like, no, you're not, right? <laughs> and, um, I was never bothered by the question, but it made me think like the place that um, you're supposed to have a, as a historian, especially if you're coming from, um, you know, if you're coming from Latin America or other um, third world, so, so uh, quote unquote third world countries. Um, it, so it is through the framework that I um, play this, this cultural identity to where I come from. Um, and a friend of mine, Juan, told me, like, you define yourself as a European scholar, but your work is very Caribbean. Like, all the, the questions that you ask are very much um, what, you know, people 
people study the Caribbean past. And um, in a way, um, I think it was um, a choice not to confront borderlands that were too close to home, the borderland between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, or the Mona Channel borderland between the DR and Puerto Rico. So that, um, I concentrated my energy in the far away borderland, <laughs> but um, with similar issues. Um, and I wanted to address your question. I didn't forget about this um, alignment between poles in Curitiba or in Paraná and, and like this, this movement toward the right. I didn't know the percentage of people who voted for Bolsonaro. Uh, she told me that it was 84%. And uh, um, um, you know, the large majority of polls voted, voted for Bolsonaro. Um, throughout the, so I stopped my analysis in the 1920s, right? And in the 19, um, especially in the 1930s, there was this drive from the Polish, um, the newly established Polish state to, to reach out to um, these pockets of Polish diaspora and try to um, work for their economy. But it was failed because it then coincided with Getulio nativism plan, and so they were basically uh, prohibited to carry uh, those colonization plans. And um, so, and then you have the Second World War, and then you have um, um, the Cold War period, Polish communism downplayed colonialism, even though they were um, carrying out um, um, partnerships with comrades in other countries that people could read as colonial relations as well. But but it was taboo, it, like, you, you are a communist, you are not colonial, you are anti-colonial. So for a while, nobody was interested in this diaspora anymore in Brazil. And, and um, uh, Rui Bakhovic, um, he's um, a prominent uh, um, historian in, in, in Paraná who studied the, the, the Polish diaspora, he always resented this um, forgetting the Polish colonies by Poland. And so now, after um, the demise of communism, I've seen um, like an approachment, like the, the, um, in 2016, the Museum of Emigrants in Gdynia um, invited me to participate in the first international conference on, um, on Poles in Latin America. And I went there after, the last time that I was in Poland was in 2005. And the difference between then and now was immense, like in 2005 four and five when I was doing research there. People, yes, exoticized me um, because, you know, they were not receiving as many immigrants and, and, you know, there were, after um, 1989, they, they, you know, they were opening the doors to um, tourism. And, but when I started going there, it was still, um, People will, will stare at me. Um, I remember one time I was riding on the metro, and I, it was 2001 or 2002. I was working on a post-communist um, research project on gender, and and there were uh, three students from the U.S. It was myself, a Korean student, and an African American student, and the three of us were sitting on the metro. <laughs> And people were just looking at us because it's so much diversity at one place. <laughs> but you know, then I, I went there to do research, and and a few years later, and this curiosity really helped me <laughs> to obtain sources because archivists they will be fascinated by the fact that somebody 
non-expectedly from like the typical places, which would be Russians, Germans, going there to the archives, but someone from the Caribbean, they were fascinated by that. So many times they would take me to the director's office of the archives and then I've, there I was explaining my research project <laughs> to, to the director because people couldn't in a way believe that someone was interested in, 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 in their history not being Pole. So that was fascinating and it helped with my Polish skills. But when I when I went there in 2016, I could feel a different Poland. Like the, the right has created this I don't, animosity, like people were not patient with me anymore. Granted, I, I'm sure I lost my Polish and <laughs> But it, and it was generational. It was like the young generation were, um, and in, in Warsaw, so I felt this this anti-immigrant <coughs> or anti-foreign um, feelings. But in this um, uh, conference, there were representatives from Paraná, and there were um, um, Polish historians, and myself. And everybody was celebrating the, this colonial process in the 19th century, the founding of the Polish colony. Like, uh, nobody was talking about race, the displacements of natives, like, like the cost of this, the, the founding of a Polish colony. So um, it, it was very um, illuminating to me that, um, you know, to hear that there's this approach, because um, after being in that conference, I'm not so surprised at all. I mean, you know, colonial discourse is a discourse that it's, it's, it works well for the right, it works well for the left. <laughs> so, and, and I have an interesting reaction towards my work where people on both sides are interested just because on the right, they want to see this um, history of being colonizers. It gives pride to their culture. And then on the left, because they're interested in pointing out that Poles could be racist and so on. So it's fascinating <laughs> times, to say the least. Anyway, I want to stop there because I'm running. <laughs>